Hey, welcome to High Resolution. My name is Bobby Goshal. And I'm Jared Arondu. Every single week we sit down with a master of the design industry. Today we've got someone pretty tall, pretty great, pretty cool. Who is it? That's Ben Blumenfeld. He's the co-director here at Designer Fund. He's going to tell us how a designer can develop a learning mindset, how any designer can actually make for an effective founder, and what he would look for if you were to pitch him your idea right now. If we started a company right now, would that make us designer founders? Yes, it would. Would we pitch Ben? We would definitely pitch Ben. Why are we doing why, why are we doing the show? Let's go start a found <laughs> let's go start a company. Well, right after this. Right after this. We'll be right back. Thanks to Squarespace for their support. Whether you need a domain, a website, or an online store, make your next move at Squarespace. Visit squarespace.com and enter the code high resolution, one word, for 10% off your first purchase. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So am I. First question, what's one thing about design that's clear to you that you don't think is clear to other designers? So I think this is something that's becoming more clear over time, but one thing uh, that we've been champion championing that we want to see uh, more designers internalize is that actually designers can make great founders. And so I think as, um, as designers start leveling up and broadening their skill sets, they can apply a design mindset to running a company and building an organization. And I think often designers see design as this craft-based thing, right? So it's like visual design or building a product. And a lot of designers still don't see designing an organization as a design problem. Uh, but over time, our hope is that we see more of that happening and more designers choosing to take that path. So and lead a company. I mean, you, you've obviously, you're putting your money where your mouth is. You've started a fund called the Designer Fund. Yes. And yeah. right, very aptly named. Yeah. Um, so interesting. You had this hypothesis that designers could make some great founders, yes. right? What are the characteristics that you pinpointed in designers that uh, made them so uh, good as, as founders? Right. So I think, you know, <clears throat> design in general is uh, a lot of designers have a natural curios curiosity and a learning. And so one thing that makes a lot of great founders is this uh, trying to apply great design to a space that maybe hasn't had great design. And so designers bring that curiosity to new spaces. Yeah. And so we've seen that time and again where a designer says, OK, well, I don't know much about the space, but instead of just coming at it full steam, they'll start with the research phase and, and look at the space and understand it. They'll team up with domain experts and kind of try to understand that. And frankly, that's what we did with Designer Fund. Yeah. Before we started, we actually interviewed like 50 other VCs and said, what, 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 do you, what do you know now that you didn't know when you started? And it gave us a really good sense of that landscape so that when we did start Designer Fund, we actually had all this wealth of information on which to build upon. What were some of those things? Uh, so one of the things that uh, people told us was like how much of a hits-based, uh, this is something we heard time and again, how much of a hits-based uh, business this is, meaning it's usually like one or two companies that will return your fund many time over and without those, you know, if like if you had a fund of 30 companies yeah. and you, let's say you had uh, a Twitter or a Facebook or a Google or an Apple in that mm -hmm. fund. If you remove that one company, the returns on that fund look pretty standard. With that one company, all of a sudden the fund becomes like this amazing fund. And so it is this exponential curve. And one of the things we heard from investors time and again is that they're, they're over the long run, they're reminded when they start looking at, at the data, when they enter it, everyone's really optimistic that all these companies are going to succeed and be great. But the reality is you have these huge outliers that are kind of like these fund makers. That's like one example of something we learned early on. So coming back to the designer founder, right? Yeah. Um, there seems to be a set of skills that they just encompass by being a designer that might set themselves up for a good CEO or founder, right? right. Um, but what is something that might be an Achilles heel yeah. for a designer founder if they aren't careful? So one thing that we've seen for designers that become CEOs there's a lot of non-design work to be done. So yes, if you bring a design mindset to the role of CEO or to the role of founder, there are a lot of advantages to that, right? Designing an organization, designing teams, designing business models. However, 
there, you know, if you're a formally trained designer and you came through design school and kind of your, your teaching is about craft and your teaching is about product design, whatever that is, you probably didn't get a lot of like business model training or you didn't get uh, a lot of training around like, you know, sizing up a market or uh, even just like, you know, there's a lot of like dealing with spreadsheets and accounting. Uh, we've even seen things like, you know, the first time a designer needs to fire an employee. It's like, wait, I've never, I've never done this yeah. before. Like, how do I, you know, what's the, what do I deal with in terms of like the legal ramifications? Do it on a Tuesday or a Friday. Some of these things, like, they're very tactical, but as a founder, you learn along the way. And there, there's a lot of non-design things that designers need to learn uh, as founders and as CEOs. I, I actually, so earlier you said um, that one of the things that designer founders have is they don't just jump to the solutions, like the really good ones start with trying to understand the problem, right. which tends to be, by the way, I've found one of the hardest parts of the design process is identifying a problem worth giving a crap about, right? Yes. Um, yeah. But I also find that another possible Achilles heel of most of the design industry, yeah. uh, in my experience, is that most people actually don't do research. Like most designers are so excited because they're so good at just creating stuff right. that they just kind of jump into the creation process. Yep. How do you like? What would you tell those people about what they're missing out on uh, without doing their homework first? I mean, the the importance of that is so huge, right? So one of the things we used to talk about at Facebook is there's a lot of uh, people who say design is problem solving. Mm. And one of the things I used to say is before you do problem solving, you should do problem seeking. Yes. Meaning understand the landscape, the problem space, so that when someone comes to you and says, you know, we need, you know, we need a redesign of this product and it should maybe work this way, you should be asking clarifying questions. Like, how do you know this? Uh, why aren't people using the thing that you feel like it needs to be redesigned? And so really great designers will often ask these like clarifying questions and they'll try and reframe a problem. And even as a young designer, you know, I used to do this all the time. Like I, I, even when I did like graphic design, someone would, uh, someone could come to you and say like, hey, uh, you know, our menu needs to be redesigned. Why? Well, because, you know, people come into the, to the restaurant, like they're not ordering like the expensive food. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, well, why do you, you know, like, why do you think it's a menu issue versus like a food issue or a space issue or, you know, restaurant design issue? So like, you can kind of like expand the problem space, yeah. and all of a sudden, like, the set of solutions becomes real broad. So you could do it in graphic design even as a young designer, but like, obviously, as like a designer CEO, you're constantly having to do that. Yeah. Uh, do you think designers are? Um, naturally, like, do they have the natural inclination to gravitate toward meaty problems? Like, say, policy, advocacy, healthcare, education, that sort of thing? Or, I, 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 like, I'm curious, I mean, you're looking at yeah, no, all these companies, right? Yeah, yeah, so I, I don't know that it's a natural, I don't think it's like a natural thing or an unnatural thing. Yeah, sure. But I, I do think one of the issues when we started Designer Fund, one of the things that we saw was Designers didn't team up with domain experts and didn't know a lot of domain experts and they didn't know a lot of great business people and they didn't know a lot of great engineers. Yeah. We tend to be a very insular community. So if you go to design schools, like a bunch of designers hanging out and they're drawing cool things and like uh, you know, designing things in isolation a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and now you're starting to have a sense of, oh, actually it would be amazing if, I, you know, Omada Health is a great example where you had uh, the people who started Omada Health actually like spent a year at IDEO looking at healthcare and becoming kind of domain experts in that field. And so more and more we want to see designers team up with domain experts to understand what, what are the issues in these various fields. And by the way, they're, they're hairy, right? Like they're, me they're difficult, they're complex, um, and they deserve that time for you to understand kind of what the issues are. And better results happen when you do that, as opposed to like, I think as designer, designers and engineers in the Valley kind of have a little bit of hubris, right? Like I saw it recently in the election, a lot of people are like, we got to do something. Let's just like build some software. Let's build some apps. Let's like, you know, we'll take Trump down. Yeah, yeah, apps will solve this. We've yeah. built apps before. And, it, you know, my first inclination is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like this like big event happened. Let's try to understand why. Like, take a moment, like, yes, we all want to act, and there are things that we can do to act, but, like, take a moment, 
Do you know anyone in government? Do you know anyone at the ACLU? Go talk to the ACLU. Understand like what, what, what's going on there. Go talk you know, to different politicians and try to understand those issues. And then start, you know, start building something. So I, I do think like we tend to think we can just throw, throw apps at the problem or throw design at the problem when really sometimes we can do with more stepping back and understanding a space. So outside of taking a step back and problem finding, yeah. um, what are some other roles or responsibilities you, you see designers overlooking today that might be costing them credibility? Costing credibility in, like internally at des in, Internally teams? at their own company yeah. um, and just within the, the industry? One of the big difficulties I think designers, and it, it's not an easy solve, but uh, you know, engineering, it's very easy to have engineering show up in the metrics, right? So a lot of companies in the Valley, they use uh, metrics like engagement or growth. Uh, and those are very easy to show like, hey, we made something faster, more people use it. So that was like a good, a, you know, we, we, we did good here. With design, sometimes it's second and third order effects. I'll, I'll give you a good example. At Facebook, on the communication design team, a lot of our products that were meant to delight and inspire and make people kind of feel good about using Facebook, you don't necessarily see that in the usage right away. And so if that is the space, is that, if that's the only data that you're looking at, it's very easy to come with a conclusion that says, okay, well, like this isn't moving the needle and like forget it. Eventually we said, well, wait a second, let's start measuring net promoter score. And that actually, you know, net promoter score is, is the question, uh, would you recommend Facebook to like a family member or friend? And it turns out that over, over time, those things that the communication design team was focused on, things like, uh, you know, hey, uh, a year ago today, like this happened, or, you know, um, it's Mother's Day today, like reach out to your mom, those kind of things that were more touchy-feely. Those were the things that really moved the, ne the needle on NPS. And so sometimes it's understanding like what metrics are we trying to move and making sure that you're actually like monitoring those things. Uh, so that's one way to do it. But sometimes you really need someone to buy into, to buy into design and believe that it's important uh, because it might not show up in those metrics. And I'll give you another Facebook example is like, we, you know, we, we built like an, what we called the analog research lab, which was this like uh, lab that creates a bunch of posters and uh, beautiful designed uh, uh, you know, those posters, ephemera, whatever for, for Facebook. And it became a real amplifier of Zuck's message to the company. And so how do you measure that? Like, how do you measure the fact that like Zuck goes and says something and then all of a sudden, you know, a couple days later, it's, it's reflected all over the space. It's kind of hard. You can kind of start seeing people, in you know, we started seeing people, like we put a, um, what would you do if you weren't afraid poster? And then a couple days later, all of a sudden people started saying, they put sticky notes and say, oh, I would do this, or I would like uh, switch teams. And some people are like, I would leave here, right? And we're like, oh, dang, like, <laughs> like okay, it's starting to get yeah, real. Really feel. And then some of them got really real and intense, right? And so, you knew that it was resonating and it was an amplifier of, of what Mark wanted to do. And so over time, he really started leaning into that. He's like, he'd pull in Ben Barry, who was the, the designer and him and Everett Kattegbeck, he'd pull them in and say, look, I need, you, I need your help here. Here's what, so I'll, when you start seeing the CEO, you know, kind of pull you into things, that's another good sign that it's working and that it's yeah. valuable, but it might not show up in these like quantitative metrics, maybe down the line it'll show up in gla you know, glass door ratings or like employee retention, but you have to believe that that'll happen because you might not see it in the short term. Yeah. Of all the people watching this right now, yeah. I'm going to guess there are maybe a hundred or so aspiring designer founders, right? Okay. What would you just, what would you tell them to start doing right now? What would you tell them to stop doing? Oh, okay. So if you're thinking about becoming a designer. You're aspiring, founder. yeah, exactly. Like you've got, you've, you feel like you've got like the sensibilities of being a designer founder. Yeah. You're willing to take some risk. What should I start doing? What should I stop doing? So one thing, start building up your, your like sphere of skill sets beyond design that, 
that uh, it's almost like you know building a company is a problem space, yeah. right? So it's like if you're going to go into healthcare, you kind of want to know about all healthcare things. If you're going to go into company building, you want to start knowing about like what it takes to build a company, right? So like be real about what are the things. You know, we recently had a, a session. We we did a a, a summit for design leaders called Source. Yeah. And at Source, uh, we partnered with Foundation Capital, who's been like a, a great supporter of ours, and Steve Asala, who's one of the original uh, you know, designers turned investors in the Valley, who's been one of our biggest champions. And we ran a, sen a session on future founders. And one of the things uh, we did in that session, we said, OK, uh, what are all the things you need to know to be a founder? Or what are all the things that a company does? Right? And so people are like, HR, legal, uh, accounting, all these things, right? And there's like 35 of them. And I started looking around the room, and when I looked at the 35 things, I was like, okay, we're all designers here. There's probably three or four that we're really, really excited about, like things that we like know and we can do well and we can apply like everything that we know to. There's probably another like seven or eight that we don't quite know, but we can apply design to do better, right? So marketing, for example. If you approach marketing with a design lens and a problem-solving lens, there's some interesting things you could do with marketing that are both quantitative and qualitative and that, that could produce great outcomes. But with legal, maybe that's like, as a designer founder, I'm not touching legal. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to know a little bit about it, but that's about it. I, I know enough that it's important, but that's it. And so it's important, one, to understand all the things Right? Like, what are all the components that a company has? What are all the things that are in your wheelhouse? What are all the things that are not in your wheelhouse yet that you want to grow in? So it's, it's books, it's meeting with people, it's growing your network. And then what are the you know, 10 to 15 areas where it's like, I'm not touching that. So my co-founder, you know, being a designer co-founder doesn't mean you have to be a, de a designer CEO. Mm -hmm. right? And so you can be a designer founder and focus on product and focus on you know, design design and have a co-founder who's really excited about the business aspect and the organizational aspect, but make sure that that person's there. And then if, there's a, if there are other components of that business that need to be figured out, make sure you have people who are excited about building those components. So that's what I would say to start doing. Um, the thing to stop doing, maybe, uh, I think you know one of the things you know if there's a, an Achilles heel for designer founders, it's maybe like they go too deep into design and kind of uh, narrow, narrow narrow their focus. And so, as designers, you know we love the blank sheet of paper, and I love the quiet and kind of like that time and space. And I think as a founder, you realize very quickly, like I don't have that. You, you know, you're not going to have a lot of that. Yeah. And so. It's starting to get comfortable with, you know, moving to the thirty thousand foot view. Yeah. Then, you know, maybe there's some times where you're moving, moving, just pushing pixels and kind of giving that detail feedback. But you got to be zooming in and out yeah. constantly. And so I would say, like, start uh, or stop if if you're going to be <laughs> moving into a founder's space. Like, hey, get comfortable with that, yeah. with 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 that motion, I guess. So we've spoken about going wide and understanding the space that you're trying to enter if you right. are becoming a founder and then yeah. knowing where to go deep, right? Yeah. Um, focusing on the going wide now and like entering an industry that you might not be familiar with, say healthcare, policy, whatever it is, right? Um, you know, w one thing that emerged in our conversation so far is having a learning mindset, essentially, right? Yeah. Like you, you have to be, you have to be curious and you have to find people who know your space better than you and learn from them, right? right? But there seems to be a tendency for designers not to do that. We already spoke about like we have the, we like execution, right? And the, the research phase doesn't always seem as sexy, right? Yeah. Um, but what are things that a designer who aspires to be a founder can do today to kind of like hack that learning mindset, essentially learning how to learn? Yeah, I don't know if it, you know, there are certain people that you know that are like naturally curious. Right. And, um, you know, I have, I have a friend who basically like we'll go to if we're at a party and there's like a table with some books on it, like it could be just like raging party, people mm -hmm. hanging out, whatever. And all of a sudden you find him in the corner and he's like reading through some book on some topic. And he's like, oh, it's really interesting. Like you guys should come like, you know, and 
uh, you know, or like walking around a city and you just see, you know, there's so many, so many times like we're just walking through a city and you just take everything as, you know, okay, someone's thought this through or like you don't even question why things are the way they are. But then certain people are like, well, like why did, why did the bike lane like, why was it like here and then it like zigzagged and then yeah. why isn't it protected? Like how did, how did, what tools is our city, like do you, you know, like we, we don't use Photoshop to design cities. <laughs> Like, how many designers know the tools that people who build cities do uh, or use? And so if you're a designer that's naturally curious, you start going down that rabbit hole. Uh, and I think a lot of designers uh, tend to stay in the problem space that they're interested in, and they don't necessarily go deeper into these other spaces. And so uh, I guess what, what your question was, like, what is, what is... Developing a learning mindset. How do you develop that? Uh, I think start questioning those things. Mm -hmm. Like start questioning why are things designed the way they are. When you walk onto an airplane, like how was this designed? Like what tools did, did people use to, to build this? Um, look around cities, look around, you know, in the political landscape right now. Like you can look at probably each individual decision and make a case for why it was done that way. But like how did we get here? Right, like what's the system that's been set up that's, that has created that complexity? And so I th it's almost like a questioning mindset. I, I, uh, when I was like 17, 18, uh, one of the things I got really into is this idea of lucid dreaming. You guys know about lucid yeah, dreaming? Yeah. So it's the idea that you can like wake up in your dream, right? Uh, and so many times you'll have a dream and in that, in your dream, you're like, oh, how did I not know it was a dream? It was like so obvious it was a dream. But like to learn to wake up in your dream, you actually need in your real life to question reality constantly. Mm -hmm. So the, the trick is like you're always like, if so anything weird happens, you're like, wait, am I dreaming? Is this a dream? And you're questioning it. And you teach yourself to do that. Like over time, you start questioning things. So then in your dream, you mimic that behavior and all of a sudden you're like, Oh yeah, the, the, you know, like one of the things is like a digital clock. You can look at a digital clock and it'll say like 6.04, and you look away and you look back and then in a dream it'll say like 7.14. Mm. Like, oh, there it is, I'm dreaming, yeah. right? And it's because you taught yourself yeah. that learned behavior. And so um, I think the, you know, the, the hack, if you will, is basically like be curious and like kind of just you know, question those things around you. And I, I don't know there's, a, there's like, a, you know, much more of a hack than that. Like, you basically just need to say, hey, this is important. Doing this will actually, like, yield a bunch of insights. Um, and especially go deeper in areas tangent. Like, design is about, like, taking something from X and applying it to Y. So if you're just in front of your screen and designing in Sketch or Photoshop, like, you're not going to be able to make these connections. And some of the best, like, design insights I've had have been you know, like learning how like agriculture is done or learning how like, um, you know, like a city is designed or it's not, they don't even call it design, like, you know, how a city is like built, you will, or made. And so those are the, th and then I pull them back into the space here. So. so not just questioning the space you're in, also looking to others and seeing if there are lessons you can pull. Yeah, I mean, what are the things that you're interested in and like go, you know, let's say like you're into music. Uh, actually, it's like it's a, th a lot of designers I meet, they're like, yeah, I'm really into music. And then when you start digging deeper, it turns out they're actually like, a lot of designers make their own music and they start like experimenting with a tool set. Not all of them, but the ones that tend to be like really, really, uh, I mean, they are, when you see that, that experimentation, uh, you see that they bring that into their design landscape. So it's like, what are the things that you're into? And like, you know, like right now I'm like into, my, my garden, like the trees That's and the awesome. plants. And I could have just been like, okay, I'll just put one here, one here, and here. But now I'm like learning like, oh, you could put a plant here and that'll bring a bee and that'll pollinate this plant. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, what if I, you know, so like, I'm just going down the rabbit hole. My wife's like, oh my God, here's like, this is your thing now. Now you're like going down the rabbit hole. And that, yeah, and every like six to nine months, I'll have something like that, that I'll just like, you know, fall into. and it, I, I think it's just really interesting Then you pull those things. You, there's always learnings that I pull in and I'll bring them into the like professional world. Uh, when you were at Facebook, you had an executive coach from what I understand. Yeah. Um, what yeah. did you, what, so first of all, what do you speak to an executive coach about? Are they, are they basically a therapist with like a fancy name? <laughs> uh, you know, it depends. Um, they can be, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's, the, you know, there are things that, 
with an executive coach, I mean, it's, it's a lot of leadership skills, it's a lot of interpersonal skills. They teach you how to be a better leader yeah. and how to connect with yeah. people. Like, I'll give you a great example. So, um, around my fifth year at Facebook, so the company had grown from, it was a couple hundred when I joined to like, it was a thousand or eleven hundred at that point. And I'd been there five years, I had like three roles. And I found there was a two or three month window where it was just like, I'm going out and trying to champion design and I'm uh, frustrated that this thing's not moving fast enough. It's like, hey, back in the day, I used to be able to just like launch a product and now I gotta go talk to legal and I gotta go talk to like the team in Germany to make sure like it translates. It's like, you know, you're just like, ah, this is like, yeah, maybe I should just leave. So you start like in the back of your head, you're like, uh, maybe I should just leave, right? Mm. And so one of the things that my executive coach Talk to me about, you know, so when I, I come into a session, and by the way, she was, it was, all, she never came in. It was always, I'd put headphones on, so actually her voice was almost like in my head. <laughs> and it was really unique. I still to this day don't know, like, the physical manifestation of this, like, sentient being. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so she, she had this, like, great voice. She's like, hello, man, like, how are things? And I'm like, ah, I'm having that in one of those weeks again where I'm like, yeah. you know, maybe I should leave. Yeah. And she goes, uh, are you going to retire there? And I'm like, well, what? And she goes, are you going to retire at Facebook? I said, no, I'm not going to retire here. Well, like, yeah, I'm starting to like, what, 65 years old and still like, you know, Facebook yeah, like, working on building apps and news. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. Like, but it'll probably be a totally different thing. But I, I, yeah. you know, I said, realistically, yeah, I'm probably not going to retire here. And she goes, OK, well, then if is not the right question. Right. The right question is, when will you know it's time oh. to leave? Man, like she just, you know, it was like with that one thing, it was like whoop, like flip, and I go, okay. And she's like, so let's start thinking about what are the conditions under which you know that it's time to leave. And so I put together these like seven conditions that if they were true, if like six of seven were true, I would know that the time had come. Right. And so that, by the way, that's a great, I mean, she pulled like a design move, right? It's yeah, a yeah. reframing of the problem, asking the right questions. So sometimes, and I'm not going to go to my manager usually and say, look, uh, I'm leaving or it's time, you know, like I'm not sure. feeling like I want to be here anymore. You can do that. But like, you know, sometimes you want someone who's out of your workspace. So an executive coach can be that person where you're, they have no skin in the game in terms of like the intra company mm -hmm. politics. And so they can be really good at helping you walk through those problems. And by the way, some of them who, if a lot of people in your company are, dealing with that person like you know it's like oh, I don't think I'm good enough to be a manager here and she goes you know what like almost everyone at your company feels this way and you're yeah. like oh because she has that you know she has those interactions she's like everyone thinks that I'm like really <laughs> everyone seems to be like crushing it and she's like nope all of you like all of you think you don't belong all of you think you're not good enough all of you think you're not smart enough she's like so but you all are so like you know like <laughs> yeah, so they also have that kind of yeah. point of view, which is really nice. So those are some of the things that I worked with the exec coach. And it's really about, you know, it's, by the way, it could be really expensive. So like, it's tough. But if, if there are more and more coaching resources that are more affordable these days. Yeah. Um, and so I, I definitely recommend it if you're starting to become more of a, a leader. And the other thing we want to see is like, we only got them as managers. Sure which I understand why to only give it to managers, but there are many leaders who are not managers who are dealing with a lot of these same things. And so we want to see more companies provide that to people across the board. So the reality is most of the people watching this don't have access to executive coaches, right? And probably won't for a while. Um, but I imagine there are some resources that they can tap into, whether it's books, podcasts, movies, whatever it is, that can help them at least capture 80% of the value and help them move forward in their career, right? What are some of those things? So there's a couple. So I'll, I'll talk about books, and then I'll talk about some things where you can lean on peers or friends. So uh, two books that I highly recommend. One is a book called Conscious Business, mm -hmm. which uh, seems like a cheesy title and seems like a very businessy book, but actually was one of the books uh, that was introduced. I think Cheryl introduced it into the Facebook culture, and since then it's become like, it's like the first thing I do when someone joined the company. I would I would have one on ones, and we'd go through chapter by chapter in this book, and it gives you th you know things like um, uh, concepts like unconditional responsibility is one of these concepts, where 
uh, you're always looking at like, what's something that I could have done here to have come up with a better outcome? So you'll hear uh, people say like, oh, sorry, I was late for a meeting, uh, traffic was bad. Right, well, you didn't, like, what? traffic was bad, yeah, and traffic can be bad, and so what you could have done was leave earlier, right? And so someone who has kind of unconditional responsibility would say, hey, sorry I'm late, I did not leave early enough. Mm. Um, or, you know, you'll often hear in companies like, hey, sorry, I'm late, I was in a meeting with like some executive, and that's why I'm late to your meeting 10 minutes. So what are they actually saying is, I actually valued their time over your time. That's why I'm 10 minutes late to you. Uh, but if you're unconditionally responsible, you would say, you would actually own, own that and say, look, I was in a meeting with, you know, some, you know, whatever, like Mark, Cheryl, whoever, and that's why I'm late. And so also, by the way, if you're in that meeting and you know that that's what you're going to say, when the meeting time is supposed to end, you would turn to that person and say, look, I have someone waiting for me in another meeting. I want to make sure I'm there on time. I'm going to have to leave right now. Right. And you have that control, right? So that's like one concept. And when an entire company has that, all of a sudden, like the interactions become much, people are owning mm -hmm. the things that they do. So it becomes like really, really valuable. So that's a great one to go through. And then there's another really, uh, and maybe it's popular, but maybe people don't know about it. It's called First Break All the Rules, mm -hmm. which is another, you know, what great managers do. And so if you're at all interested, in becoming a manager, it's, it's a great management book. So those are two books. In terms of ways to get some of the kind of like that feedback or, uh, so one of the things I did uh, early on in my career is, or not early on in my Facebook career, because I realized there were things I could not talk to my coworkers about. So I found four or five friends of mine who worked at similar stages in their career at different companies. One guy was at Google, another at Apple. Um, and I said, let's get together every five to six weeks yeah. and talk about things that are happening at work that we, we, we don't have, you know, coworkers are not gonna wanna talk about this because it's, you know, maybe you're thinking about leaving Apple or Google or maybe like some managers, you know, so you're not talking to your coworkers about it. At the same time, your friends probably have too much skin in the game so if you say like, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm frustrated with, with my manager and I don't, I don't quite know how to like uh, relate to that and your friends might just be like, look, you, you, you know, maybe they're, like, they're more careful to make sure that you personally uh, are going to do okay and they're not going to push you in terms of like developing your career. And so these were people that were friends but they were taking the role of almost like a career counselor in that in that council, that five, six person council. And we met every five to six weeks. Mm -hmm. And we'd go into those, those, uh, those gatherings with, everyone would say like, here's some things that are on my mind right now. And you'd, you'd send them ahead of time, a day or two, so everyone could kind of consider them. And that, by the way, and that, those, th those were so valuable and so helpful to understand how other companies were dealing with it and how other people in my, in my kind of similar level were also like frustrated about similar things or, or actually some things that I was just frustrated with that they didn't have. And so that was like, that was enlightening too. I thought, oh, probably all startups are like this. Well, no, actually only yours. Mm. Oh crap, okay, well, I, I need to like think about how I, how I do better there. Uh, so that's a, another way, tactical way that you can, and it's fun too, right? like getting, to, but it, 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 it's getting together in a different context. So that's another thing. And by the way, you can even do it with one person. Find someone who's kind of a peer, but maybe a little bit of, you know, maybe they have a few years on you and say, I would love to meet with you every like four to six weeks, and I don't wanna like shoot the shit, or I don't, you know, I don't wanna just like, what I wanna actually get down and, and talk to you about things that are happening at work, or things that I'm thinking about with my career, and, and get your kind of like unfiltered feedback on that. Thanks again to Squarespace for supporting the show. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to get a domain, create a website, or build an online store. They make it simple to manage your online store and inventory, process orders, print packaging slips, and customize emails. Squarespace has powerful marketing tools. They ensure that search engines can find your store online, provide real-time analytics to help you gain customer insights, and let you connect with your customers on Facebook, Twitter, and more. If you've been thinking about starting your own online store, visit squarespace.com and enter the offer code HIGHRESOLUTION, that's one word, to get 10% off your first purchase. Make your next move with Squarespace. We'd also like to thank our friends at Envision for their support. 
Envision is the world's leading product design platform, powering the future of digital design through their understanding of the importance of collaboration. They're used by some of the most innovative companies in the world, like Facebook, Capital One, Netflix, and Airbnb. I work with remote teams all the time, and I found that keeping a healthy dialogue is really important. Without it, building strong work relationships gets a lot harder, and that leads to poor collaboration. I've also found that prototypes are a great way for me to show my full vision for a design, and this helps cut down a lot of back and forth. Envision makes all of this really easy. You can rapidly prototype your designs and collaborate across every stage of your project, taking your ideas from concept to code. It simplifies virtually every aspect of the design workflow and makes collaboration a core part of the process for everyone, from project managers to designers, developers, and writers. Teams that build digital products are at a serious advantage when they use Envision's suite of prototyping and collaboration tools. It's the best way to get everyone on board. Visit envisionapp.com slash high resolution for three months free. Okay, so you're a partner yeah. at Designer Fund. Um, before we start talking about like how stuff works here and, and what kind of companies you look for and whatnot, uh, I was actually still curious whether, because you guys are four years old, yeah, right? Um, is Designer Fund still an experiment? Like, are you guys are you guys resolved on designers making great founders? Yeah, uh, or is this still an open question? Is it still an open question? Designer Fund, I think, will well maybe experiment is going too far, but I think we always want to be uh, assessing our assumptions constantly. And I, I, by the way, like. I think great design is that. Like, you want to be constantly saying, like, is, is what I took to be true six months ago still true? Yeah. And in venture, by the way, things, you know, one of the things we are learning is that things are changing very fast, like constantly, right? This isn't, this isn't graphic design. This, this, is, this is, you know, it's like, hey, in December, things were like this. Now it's, it's March, and actually different dynamics are oh, taking shit. hold, and there's different players. and. Uh, it's a constant change, and so we want to be testing everything constantly. Uh, that said, the idea that the fundamental core principle that the next generation of great companies are going to have great tech, business, and design, I think is absolutely holding true and will continue to hold true. Yeah. So there's kind of that tr true north that totally is, is, is validated now with data, is validated with experience, and we continue to like march towards that. The ways that we do it is gonna be constantly like, we're, we're always trying new things. You know, we just had that, the, the summit for 200 people. That was, for us, we've always taken a very intimate, deep, authentic method to events. Uh, and again, you know, Steve at, at Foundation was like challenging us, hey, what it, could you bring that authenticity to scale? And so this was a 200 person event and you can definitely see how a 200 person event would all of a sudden lose that. Yeah. But we kind of brought that the designer fund depth and intimacy and vulnerability and openness yeah. and the feedback so far has been like you guys did do it. And so that was an experiment and it worked and we're going to co probably continue to do that. Yeah. Have you found any parts of your assumptions around designer founders proven wrong in the past four years? Not proven wrong, but one of the things uh, you know we talked about earlier was the idea that uh, there are you know the vast majority of the people we invest in are designer founders. There's another segment of founder, which are people that say, "I value design. Look at my track record. You can see that." And they want to bring in design early, but they're not necessarily designers. And those kinds of founders actually are really compelling as a partner. And we've done it now twice recently. And in both cases, it was like the first thing that we did, it's like, okay, how do we bring in design in a big way and early on? So it's like connecting them with freelance designers, connecting them with agencies, starting to work on the, on the brand and the voice. And, uh, with the you know it, it within months we were able to uh, you know with the first company we brought in a, a designer redid their brand they're reworking on the product and so those types of founders I think you know for us as we go deeper in this I think will be part of that ecosystem and an important part uh, because I do think that designers need to be more inclusive we need to say like 
it's not like, well, you didn't go to design school, so you're not a real designer. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, they're, they're valuing design. They're investing in design. Uh, they're bringing a designer mindset. And so, yeah, that is, that is also design, and we need to be like bringing that into the fold. So just, just to have a little bit of fun, I mean, you were, <laughs> you're, um, you were early enough at Facebook, mm -hmm. right? I want to test the waters on how designer fun defines designers, yeah. okay? Uh, you worked with Mark Zuckerberg. Would you have invested in Mark Zuckerberg through Designer Fund? Is he a designer founder by your definition? Yeah, I would say so. Mark is someone, you know, would I have invested in 2004, Mark? Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I invested with my life in 2006, Mark, right? right? And the thing that Mark had by the time, even, or, you know, by the time I, I joined, yeah. is he absolutely valued design. Sure. And by the way, he got better and better and better at it. Uh, as time went on, but Aaron Sittig, who was the first designer, so that so that's one signal. We look at like you know, as designer fund, we look at like how early did you bring design in? And Aaron Sittig was one of the first hires at Facebook, and Aaron did a great job of kind of partnering with Mark and showing him the value of design. And so, by the time I came, and he was bought in, like he would sit. I mean, he literally sat designers in front of his desk yeah. so that he, your design is very visual, right? Coding is lines, you can't quite see what coders are doing. Design is very visual. We had these big 30 inch monitors and he could just kind of peer down and see what was going on and he'd walk by and just yeah. be like, so why, what's going on? Why are you doing this? Um, and so it was very clear that he was valuing it and believed it to be a very important and a key part of building Facebook early on. So yeah, I would say, I, well, I would hope, you know, I invested with my life and time. Uh, and so yeah, I would hope like the next yeah. person like Mark that, that comes around designer phone that we would invest in them too. You better hope that. Yeah, 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 that would be amazing. It's a hit space business, right? Exactly. Um, so you've had the opportunity to invest in many companies, many companies in the Bay Area, surrounding, um, in the design space, right? Have you noticed any patterns on how the best companies um, approach design in their business? The best companies, how do they approach best design? Best companies you've invested in approach design yeah. in their business. Yeah, well, well so, so one is the ones that we invest in, ha like at least invest in it, right? And so, I, I, you know, we're already kind of f filtering for that. But actually, you know, there are a lot of companies that don't have that. And so you can see the impact of design early on. You know, I was telling you guys, like even in, uh, there's a company that's in the healthcare space and they invested a ton in design early on when they were it was two two people they invested in, in design and that creates the trust and for a lot of people it's like well you don't need to invest design when it's just the two of you like just try to get customers and the founder said well no actually it's, design is going to be the way we do that it's not going to be through like ads or it's not going to be through some of this other, these other methods but actually by creating a, a product that people trust and want to use and design is like a key yeah. way to do that and so, uh, you know, the, the, like just fundamentally, those companies are investing in design early on as opposed to thinking about bringing it on later, you know, when they're like 80, 100, 200 people. Um, in terms of how they do it, I think you do see, uh, you know, one danger is like going too deep into that craft mentality early on. And I think the, the companies that do design best early on understand the iteration and that there's a speed element that you need in design early on and not to be too precious with it. So like, yeah, quality is important, craft is important, uh, product, you know, building a great product is important. At the same time, like, you cannot be going off for three, four months off in your own world without testing your assumptions, without putting lo-fi prototypes in front of people. Uh, you just don't have that luxury, like time is not on your side. So. At, at the early stage, the best way to do design is really, you know, you almost need to be comfortable. There's a famous saying where it's like, if, if you feel really good about the thing you're putting out, you've waited too long, right. right? You should always feel like it's not quite there. It's not like I didn't quite get it. And that means like you, you put it out into the world. I think that's the Reed Hoffman thing, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Never, never feel like you're like, ah, okay. Like it's like yes. perfect. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. So. I'm a designer, yeah. right? This is a scenario. I, I am a designer, but this is but a scenario. But this is also hypothetical. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a designer, and I have a startup, right? Okay. And I want to pitch you. I want your money. Yeah. Your, like, 
Design a few buddies. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the buddies. Yeah. Um, all, the, <laughs> all, all your money. We want it all. <laughs> what would you be looking for in me and my pitch in the first meeting? We we have a very you know I, I think like in terms of what we look for it's it's not super con there are things that we've innovated on mm -hmm. and then there's things at Designer Fund that we say we don't need to innovate on these things and um, in terms of like what we look for I would say like we look for what most VCs look for but the the thing that we add on top to it is is design gonna have a fun make a fundamental difference in the outcome of this company like can they actually win with design. And so we look at things like, is the market massive, right? Like a lot of time, and by the way, like designers, I don't know if maybe it's because we only look at designers, but there are definitely designers who kind of go into these niche areas and it's an interesting space and you can probably do, you know, create some business around it. But for venture, you need kind of big outcomes. And so without a big market, like you're just not gonna get there. You know, we liken it to like a wave, a big market, it's like you can have like a beautiful surfboard and you can be super talented and if there's no wave, you're just going to sit on the water and the market is that way. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Right? And so big market, uh, mission-driven team. Like it, there's like a, a founder problem fit, right? So if you're going to like look at creative tools, you I'm like, okay, well, that's like this guy's just been using creative tools like forever. If you came to me and you said, Hey, I'm going to change the way like glasses are manufactured. I mean, like, well, you've never, you've never <laughs> dealt with, you've never even looked at, yeah, yeah, you don't even wear glasses. Like, wh why are you doing this? Why is this important to you? Uh, and so we look at someone who comes to us and say, you know, uh, Max Ventil, who started Alt School, he's one of the most phenomenal founders, and he came, you know, he goes, the past ten years have led me here. Like, I've been explicitly developing my knowledge and skill set for a decade so that I could take the swing with alt school, right? That, I mean, that, when someone comes to you with that, mm -hmm. then, you, okay, like, this is a serious person who's like, they're, they're not just like, yeah, we're going to try this, and then we'll pivot to this other thing. It's yeah. like, no, this is what I want to do. I know the space like the back of my hand. I know the people I want around it. I have the skill sets to make it happen. And, and that, like, I mean, that... That speaks volume. So that's another, you know, uh, founder problem fit, uh, market uh, traction. Often when we invest, there's some sort of traction happening, uh, and then we we look at the product, right? So by being product designers, we can actually assess: is this way better than what's happening? What what's available, right? So Remix is a company that was started by two designers and two engineers out of Code for America, and they built a new way to de design public transit. And what people were using before that was, you know, a bunch of big maps and Sharpie. Like anytime software is going to replace pen and paper <laughs> and is making a not 20% improvement, but a 3,000% improvement. Meaning like for a remix, you know, they overlay data on top of, you can draw as if you're drawing on Google Maps. They overlay data so you know like if you move this bus route from here to here, here are like the different demographics you're serving. Here's like how many more people you need to drive the buses. Here's what you need to pay them. Here's what all that data is available like instantly. And so stuff that used to take them months is now done in hours. That's thousands of percent different, right? So those kinds of differences for us are really, really compelling versus the like, yeah, we, we do it like 6% 6, 6 better than yeah. what's out there. Well, okay. So, uh, yeah, fundamentally, market, team, traction, a lot of the things that a lot of the VCs look at, but we also look at, is design going to be a big difference maker for them? Well, listen, before we go to community questions here, just no one's watching, so who's your favorite company that you've invested in? No, <laughs> you can't, yeah, I don't know if I have a... Everyone's got a favorite. No one wants to talk about their favorite. I don't have a, yeah, like, no, we, we, so many of them are great, but like, I, I, I would say like the ones that are truly... There's some where they're bringing design to these really underserved spaces. Sure. So Remix is that Omada Health, which you used to work at. Yeah. You know, it's like the better Omada does, the more lives are saved. Yeah. And that alignment of company mission and uh, good in society, and by the way, and they're bringing design to a space that doesn't have it, and they're bringing that IDO DNA to it, yeah. and they're great people, and they value design, and, yeah. and, and, and. and. And so there's definitely like, you know, a few months after the Amada investment, 
you know, our portfolio, uh, uh, our kind of model basically said about 30 companies. And I just thought, man, if we had like 30 of those, you know. Total Mata. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 30 of like, just people Winning. who are like, what? Winning. Yeah, yeah. It just, you know, it just feels great to be able to help bring those companies success. Uh, and that was, you know, that was really like why we, why we started the whole thing was because we wanted to have like a broader impact. All right, so we reached out to our community and we asked them what's burning up in their minds and they gave us five questions that we want to go through with you. Okay, so every guest is going to answer these, so you're not alone. Okay. Um, but you need to be the best. That's the pressure. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> so the first question, how should designers explain the role of design to people in their business? How should designers explain the role of design yeah. in their business? Um, what we want to see is design. I think a lot of people will look at design and say it's, it's kind of that visual layer and it's going to make things look, yeah. look better. Uh, what we want to see is designers explain the strategic importance and the ability of design to move really key fundamental metrics for a business. And you can show that, like, you know, you can show that in key metrics like engagement and growth and you know design can move a needle like that like engineering does yeah. and so designers shouldn't shy away from that but it does mean that as a designer you need to start understanding the data of the things that you know like when you design something there's some some effect uh, and you need to understand like that data effect and so you need to start working with that uh, so yeah designers may be leaning into that and then they can then they can showcase that. The second question is around team organization, right? So looking into these investments you've made and the design teams that have been built there, have you seen any patterns on how they're organized that tend to lead to um, good outcomes? The design team is specifically. How the design team is organized, I would say uh, one of the maybe one of the fundamental like uh, principles is that. Uh, in a physical space, or in or in terms of like uh, how the team is organized. See, I'm asking like on like, like on like on an org chart. Yeah. On an org chart. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think the how you're organized in an org chart is actually um, okay. super problematic because you can you know for example at Facebook we reported in through product the communication design team reported in through product. And so it would have been easy for us to say, well, we only do comm design as it relates to product. But actually what we did do is we said, well, actually communication design is going to have to serve much more broadly the entire company. So even though we reported in through product, we started meeting with other parts of the company and say, what would you do with great design resources, whether it be HR or legal or sales? Uh, and it illuminated all these, again, like it illuminated this huge problem sphere. And so the, where you are situated design in the, in the org chart, it can box you in. So we could have easily done that. And it, the perception can be that, oh, well, comm design at Facebook should only serve product. And so those are the perceptions that you're working within. But as a design leader on a team, and if you're thinking about, okay, given where we're situated, what does that say about how team, the other teams perceive us? What does that say about how the CEO is going to interact with us? What does that say about the type of work that's expected out of us? So you need to know those constraints. But then given those constraints, how does our team impact the company? And you should not let where you sit in the org dictate that. Yeah. The next question is, um, if you're the only designer in a company, yeah. how do you convince the leaders in that company of the value of design? Well, hopefully, if you're a designer fund company, you don't have to because the designer is, you know, they're, course, they're sitting yes. on the executive team yeah. and they brought you in because they value design. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I kind of say it jokingly, but, but frankly, that is the world that we want to see because we've seen so many these examples of, hey, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a designer, I'm on my own, no one on the exec team values design, how do I, cha how do I change that? Mm -hmm. And part of me, when I heard those stories, I said, like, you're a great designer, you shouldn't be spending half your time trying to convince folks I of the value. More. It's like, Absolutely. go work at like the, num like the growing number of companies who say, 
We value design. We're just going to give you that runway. We know the impact it can have. Like, go be a great designer. Come be a great designer here. So that's like, you know, one mantra. But if, if you are like, for whatever reason, him. Hey, I'm, I'm in a company. People don't value it. Um, what what can I do? So it's you got to almost like demonstrate the value through execution. So it's it's not uh, being frustrated. They don't get it. Uh, so basically, design education. One of the things I used to do at Facebook every couple of weeks, I would do a design course, like a two-hour course on like basic design to engineers, mm -hmm. so that they understand. It's like oh wow, like. This is the way design works, and this is this is why a designer is asking me these questions. Oh wow, that's really interesting. So all of a sudden now, uh, engineers had like a fundament, like a little bit more overlap in terms of language, and you should be doing it with exact. Like any time I interacted with Mark, and he was just like, "Well, blue is bad. Can you make it purple?" It's easy to be like, well, "He never said that." It was more like, "Hey, purple is bad. Make it make blue." Make it blue, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know. You, it's easy to just be like, well, it's a CEO. I should just, OK, I'll make it blue. Um, but I actually took all those interactions. It's like every interaction I have with this person is an opportunity to teach them about design. So it's like, hey, by the way, you know, blue actually has a certain connotation. And actually, we use blue everywhere. Yeah. And so like, when we make this blue, it says, like, it, it's just going to fade into the background. If we use green, actually, all of a sudden, this thing's going to pop more. And, and, and by the way, we're going to see it in the metrics. Or I actually already tried it, and actually green works way better. Do you still want it blue? Right. right? That's uh, the so, best. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've already tested it. Yeah. Um, and so use all the interactions. Instead of being frustrated people don't get design, say, OK, people don't get design. That is a, uh, a way for you to teach and educate. It's an opportunity and teach people about design. So that's like a, uh, one way. Demonstrate its value over and over. So I think like. It's easy for designers to like do design, go on to the next thing, do design, go on to the next thing. I eventually I got to the point internally where I said, what if I treated our team as a company? Right? So inside Facebook, the stuff that the comm design team did, how would I market that? The same way a company would market to an audience. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna start a newsletter internal. Mm where it's like all the highlights of what the team did over the past like month. And I would show the metrics, and here's the work we did. And so I, I was treating it as you know, almost like its own internal, uh, yeah, like a company. And using all, all the things I learned to, to bring Facebook to the world, to bring communication design to the company. Right. And all of a sudden, that mindset really allowed us to uh, educate people on the value of it and I'll, you started seeing more people like hey can you do this for us hey can, can we work with you and it's like we don't have time but we can connect you to freelancers we connect you to agencies and all of a sudden like the uh, amount of love and respect for design and desire to work with design grew and grew and grew so that's another thing you can do that's awesome the next question is how should designers measure and present the results of their work at a business how should they measure? One is make sure you do measure it. You know, so a lot of designers just don't. Mm -hmm. So at least you're already like starting with the uh, with the <laughs> assumption that yeah. they should, which yeah. is good. Um, yeah, I would say you know there's like simple. Depending on if you're at a young startup, like start learning Google Analytics, start learning. There's a lot of like really uh, really simple analytics tools that people can start using so that they can say. Like, okay, well, like, this thing was poorly designed. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times it's easy to just be like, well, it's, look, it's so much better. Isn't it clear that it's so much better? Um, but it's another uh, case to say this looks way better. And by the way, more people sign up through this page now. Oh, and by the way, uh, fewer people drop off at this, at this point in the flow. And so having the, the data-informed approach is really valuable. Uh, so I would say, like, start learning some of those tools. If you're at a company that's big enough and you have data analysts, like, go befriend those people. They are, you know, I, I basically became, like, buddy buddies with all those people. And even sometimes, I, you know, I'd be like, hey, I know you're not on my project, but, like, I need, like, this data or that data. And even better, it's like, hey, can you show me how I would, I would pull this information so I could, so I don't even need to rely on you. Just show me how to do it once. Uh, and don't be scared of that, right? Like, yeah, it's SQL and all that, but, like, Design, like as a designer, if you're taking a learning mindset, like start adding that skill set to your repertoire, and you 
becomes so powerful. Yeah, one of my favorite is like Rochelle King at Spotify. She leads design and insights there, mm -hmm. um, and she literally calls data people data friends. Yep. Like I, I love that. They have yeah. a T-shirt. Like, it, yeah, they have a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Our data friends, right? Yeah. So I completely. And but you can serve them too. You can be like, hey, I'll redesign the dashboard, right. or I'll you know I'll help you succeed yeah. if you help give where you can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, we're at the last question. All right. Okay. Feeling good. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so as the purpose of design continues to evolve, yeah. what are some roles or methodologies that you think might emerge over the next five years? Roles for designers? Roles for designers, roles in design. Um, actually, interesting, right? Maybe not. I mean, let's go a little bit broader. Yeah. Roles in design, not necessarily for designers as the way we think of designers today. Right. Yeah. Uh, so definitely the, the designer founder is obviously like one sure. role that we think will continue and we hope that continues to emerge. Um, you know, you'll start seeing more and more designer, you know, I think like you guys introduced me to like the DEO, which I get, you know, again, like VPs of design are really rare these days, but starting to become more common. Uh, the... Yeah, yeah. So I guess like the designer executive officer. Yeah. I mean, I do think you know when you start actually looking back in history, you know, we just uh, read a book called "Let My People Go Surfing" mm -hmm. by the founder of Patagonia, and you read his story and you're like, he was a designer founder. Like he absolutely like you know he started by designing climbing equipment and building and manufacturing and making it, and so he maybe doesn't say that he's a designer, but all the activities and everything he did and everything he like considered and quality and care, and he's a designer. Yeah. And so I think that we are going to be, see this like much more inclusive uh, view of design where design, you know, design is now being taught in a bunch of business schools, right. which it's like a dual, double-edged sword. But you will see people who are more maybe like business oriented or uh, analytical starting to come into design and bringing that kind of not a like, you know, not the crafty viewpoint of like capital D design, but more of like an entrepreneurial mentality, you know, entrepreneurial background or a business background into the design sphere that I think is going to be really interesting. And it's, it's easy for us. And I know I, I had this too. It's easy as designers to be like, they're not. They're not real. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Like they don't get deal. it. Yeah. They're not. They're not. They're not yeah. part of the tribe. But like, I actually think it's really important that we do try to bring them in and try to learn from those people and try to be more inclusive. I mean, the really, like the world that we want is not one where design is still held by a few. But like, I think all designers would. Be, you know, if I said, "Hey, design design's going to be taught in elementary school," you would all want that. Yeah. Well, what would that mean? It mean like all of a sudden. Design is like English or like math or like science. Like it be can become a thing that everyone is taught. Yeah. And in that world, all of a sudden, yeah, it's like de good design is like de facto. Yeah. Um, that's the world like we all want to move towards and live in, right? So we, I think we need to be more inclusive if we want to move into that world. Well, that's a good positive note to end on. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, man. absolutely. Thanks, guys. Hey, you made it to the end. Congratulations. Thanks for watching the episode. I really, really hope you liked it. If you did like it, please leave us a review on the iTunes store. And by the way, if you have any questions that came up because of the content that, that we covered with our guests, go on YouTube, go on Twitter. You can tweet us, you can leave us a comment. We'll get back to you. We'll help you as much as possible. At High Res Podcast. That's the, the screen name or the handle for Twitter, for Instagram, for Facebook. Find us talk to us. We want to converse with you. Uh, we're not going to leave here, by the way, without also thanking our friends at Searl Video. They've been an amazing partner on this entire project. So Searl Video is a creative studio based out of Portland, Oregon. They've helped creative communities tell stories for over 10 years. They've done advertisements, behind the scene footage, um, and documentaries for companies like Google, Slack, XOXO Festival, Adobe, Intel. They're incredible. They've traveled with us through the entire country documenting these stories with our guests. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Searl. Listen, if you're a startup looking to elevate your product, if you're a big company looking to humanize your brand, if you're someone in the creative community who just wants to tell a story, you've got to check out the team at Searl Video. It's searlvideo.com, S-E-A-R-L-E, video.com. Check out our friends at Searl. Thank you so much, guys. You guys have been incredible on this project.